Next, I will request to Professor U. Uh, Meenakshandran to give a talk on how to manage your vertigo. Please, sir. Oh, uh, before I start talking, that was a very interesting topic, so I can't help but talk a few points about that. The important thing to remember again is that EEG is abnormal in 40% of patients with seizures. If you do an interactive EEG, 60% in general in generalized tonic clonic seizures would be abnormal. So normal EEG does not rule out a seizure. That's about, that explains why there are books of EEGs, because the positivity rate or the yield of an EEG improves with repeated recording. So it happens. So it's not uncommon for syncope to be treated as seizure, seizure to be treated as syncope. It all requires that one five, two to five minute intensive questioning of the patient where you don't lose focus, make sure the patient doesn't lose focus either. What complicates the issue further is if you have prolonged syncope, you can have convulsions. So that complicates it completely. If somebody has prolonged uh, hypoxia to the brain, it's going to have seizures. So there is, let's say, a Stoke Adams attack. Heart stops for some time. The brain is going to get irritated, you will have convulsions too. So there, it, it, it's always a problem because it's very difficult to diagnose a syncope unless there is something overt in the ECGs or on a hunter. Okay. I'll, I'll go on to vertigo. Uh, I'm sure all of you treat vertigo. And vertigo is probably one you know, of the commonest symptoms that patients come to you know with. And there is this specific where I have this million dollar question and never been on, answered by anyone. What is GAR? No, that is what our patients complain. So GAR are no, it, this GARIS doesn't exist in any language. Only place I've seen GARIS in France, you know, the train station, like Gare do not and Gare do so. And that's uh, the only place I've seen GAR. So when they say GAR, it means some sort of dizziness. That's what it means. So I, I'm going to be talking about this is just to show you about that film by Alfred Hitchcock. Now you probably if you had a hearing clinic, vision clinic, you probably have vertigo clinic that way, because that's how the patient is going to see. <laughs> so, this is the era of specialized clinics. And, uh, you know, I'm just going to recap the anatomy fast. The It's a complex interaction of visual, vestibular and proprioceptive inputs with the CNS integrates. You know, you need to sense, you need to see, you need to know where your neck is. So it's a complex interaction. And uh, there are three symptoms. Vertigo is uh, one of my favorite topics and I've done this in many fora. So this presentation will have some 250 slides. So it's not going to be 250 perfectly. So I have <laughs> tripped it down. So it doesn't depends on what is done. So this is the basic thing. And you know there are semicircular canals and there are the posterior canals, the horizontal canal and the anterior or the superior canal. So this is what helps us with this rotation, this rotation. So it senses the fluid moves, like you know, what uh, the mason uses in the uh, while constructing. That mercury moves, so you know we know where we are standing. The balance is always uh, sent to the brain. I'm going to skip these. The travel, travel will Okay, so this is the vestibular portion of the eighth cranial nerve, and has the Superior division, uh, which is from the utricle and the part of saccule, the horizontal anterior canal is the inferior division, and they go to the vestibular nuclei as well as to the cerebellum, obviously, because this balance is very important. The eighth nerve. This is the vestibular system. So we have uh, the linear accelerations, like if you're traveling in a car, gravity related accelerations, like if you're traveling in a lift. And then you have all these angular accelerations, you're turning the head, bending down, looking this way, that way on. So this is the angular acceleration is by the semicircular canals. The sacral and the utricular copy, the autolith organs, they help with these. They all go to the central nervous system and then there is integration of visual proprioceptive tactile, 
you will remember this basic schema and be easy to understand. This is what the prevalent study said that there was a prevalent study that they did in the last month they asked uh, a population based study and then said one in five adults reported dizziness. Could be anything. So dizziness is just a terminology increases in elderly person by decreased visual acuity, proprioception, vestibular input. So it's a non specific term. See, it could mean vertigo, it could mean that they just are weak, they are anemic, they have had a syncope, they probably have giddiness, depression, pre-syncope, anxiety, unsteadiness, anything. So GAN is this dizziness. It's very important. It, it doesn't take much time. I'm mean, just going to tell you how to manage this in the clinic. It's very easy. So what vertigo is? Yes, it's not just me. Then a perception of movement, either of self or of the environment. So if they feel, if they see things moving, we call it objective vertigo. If they feel they are moving, we call it subjective vertigo. That's all that's whatever. Could be peripheral or central and single is transient loss of consciousness. Loss of posture at all. So they fall down. And then of course, we have the We have these uh, terminologies called presynco, psychiatric dizziness, which has nothing to do with vestibular dysfunction. This equilibrium is just a sensation of floating. Next slide. So, if you look at dizziness, vertigo, disequilibrium, there are. If somebody says I'm dizzy, it's one of four things. Either there is a sensation of motion, when we call it vertigo, or there is a sensation of impending faint, which is single which Dr. Gruber said, so uh, elegantly talked about. Then you have this sensation of disequilibrium, which occurs in many neurological disorders, including, including sensory ataxia, cerebral ataxia, all that. And then you define giddiness other than vertigo, syncope, or disequilibrium, where you just can't define. Then they just say, you know, you know what other, but I can't define. And that's mainly psychiatric. Anxiety is one of the commonest reasons for this business. It's like these are all these uh, symptoms which are encompassed by the term dizziness. We'll go on. Next. The presenting symptom could be vertigo, which is very for central vestibular, disequilibrium, rocking or swaying, motion sickness, swimming or floating, or oscillopsy. If somebody has oscillopsia, which means that they see everything going up and down. As he walks, the room goes up and down like that. That's oscillopsia. That means that there is bilateral vestibular disturbance, where the uh, balance system is gone on both sides. Next slide. I think we'll move on. I, I won't go into this. So, let I go, I'm just reiterating the point, is an illusion. It's important to know that this is an illusion. Things are not moving, but you see it as when the brain believes things are moving. So, an illusion of motion implying a disorder of the solar system, either the peripheral labyrinth or its central connection. Next slide. I think we'll move on. Next slide. So, the, so when you approach a patient with vertigo, important to ask about the history, 
Do they have autonomic symptom? Do they sweat? Do they have vomiting? Do they feel like going to the toilet? Well, all those things are autonomic. They onset auditory disturbances, neurologic disturbances, was there a syncope, all these things. But then, we are going to see, there are only two things, to, important things to remember. What is the duration of the whole thing? It's very important. That's the, the pattern of onset and duration. Very, very important in a vertigo. When you ask about hearing abnormalities and what triggers. Just these three points, they give you the diagnosis. Any of the other investigations will already support. Next slide. This is the question that most of us have when seeing a patient, that what scares people. That's where our uh, uh, business runs. Does my dizzy patient have a stroke? A systematic review bedside diagnosis. This was you know, acute vestibular syndrome. And they found that you can have stroke which we closely mimic peripheral vestibular disorders with obvious focal neurological signs which are absent in more than 50% of people. So it may present just with the vertigo, but there are always eye signs which anybody who is keen on eye movements would definitely make out. The next slide. So this is what we need to note in history. Patients, when they are giving you the history, very important to make them, uh, keep them focused. Very, very important. They frequently change the report of the type of dizziness. You know, when they talk to my junior doctor, they give a different history, and when they come here, they give a different history. And if, this, if it comes to the examination, poor guy is gone. So that's what happens. The emphasis should be on the duration of the episode and what triggers it. I think that's the most important thing. Any illusory sense of movement. He says, I walk, I feel like walking on the moon, it's vertigo. So that's what we need to remember always. Next slide. So this is called the timing and triggers approach. The vertigo. If you have an acute vestibular syndrome, it is spontaneous and it is prolonged. It just comes on, no trigger. It just comes on like that. It's most likely vestibular neuronitis or it's a posterior circulation stroke. The two of them, they just start suddenly and continue through the day. If it's episodic, it just comes. Lasts about classically lasts about 30-40 seconds, and then is positioned. As I get up in the morning, I get it. As I lie down in the bed, I get it. As I roll over in bed, I get it. Then it's probably PPPV, but it can also be central. It's episodic, but it comes on spontaneously. And there is a history of headache, or, or there is a, it may, may or may not be associated with the vertigo. The patient is a known migrator, they probably dealing with vestibular migraine, the probably menius. Menius is a combination of Vertigo, tinnitus and vomiting. Tinnitus need not be present. But what is always present is some loss of hearing. Uh, that's why the ENT surgeon is more important for a diagnosis. We always get an audiometry done. If there is, has to be some deafness to <coughs> diagnose menius. And then there is chronic unsteadiness with or without osteopsia. And they probably talking about either cerebellar or bilateral vestibular. The next slide. So history taking, if it is momentary, then it is a sequel of severe unilateral vestibular failure because it adapts. If it's in seconds, about 5 to 90 seconds, usually about 30 40 seconds, it's BPPV. If it's minutes, let's say 2 to 20 minutes, it occurs in DIA or in very fistula. It lasts for hours, more than 20 minutes, less than 12 hours, probably dealing with menias or rarely failing fistula. Next slide. This is what international classification has several layers. Next slide. This is for the neurologist. What this is what the neurologist is supposed to look for in his diagnosis from his people living abnormalities, the extra movements, eye movements. I'm going to show you a few examples. Next slide. So this is how this is of all of the the whole tabular column. What is important to remember is that the vertigo that is most disabling to the patient. He says of severe vertigo, I'm vomiting is probably not central. The one that is not so disabling, he says I am unsteady and he is not vomiting that much, is probably sent. So the one that is most disabling is probably the benign one. More frequent autonomic things occur with peripheral. And the commonest diagnosis is BPPV or migraine. And it is variable with central, need not, need not occur. If somebody has severe vertigo and vomiting, very unlikely to be central, not that it is not central. And the auditory symptoms may are usually present only in peripheral. Somebody says I have hearing abnormalities, either loss or tinnitus, probably peripheral. You can get acute hearing loss, but not. It occurs only in one syndrome called hyper syndrome. The next slide. Next slide. <coughs> Sorry, the previous one. So, 
So out of the peripheral vertigos, there are only five entities: BPPV, labyrinth that is, Meniere's disease, vestibular neuritis, and acoustic neuroma. Everybody is scared about acoustic neuroma. It's not the commonest cause. It's usually a chronic disorder causing more imbalance and some vertigo. And BPPV is the commonest diagnosis of all the peripheral, uh, thankfully, of all the peripheral vestibular disorders. The next slide. Of central vertigo, of course, the commonest is the posterior circulation stroke. It can occur in multiple sclerosis. It can occur in so many other causes in the brain, including metabolic causes. Next slide. So we'll see some case scenario. I'm just going to be done with that. 35 years old female. She comes with sudden onset, spinning of the room, and she rolled over in bed this morning to get up. So she was lying down, she rolled over, and then she had this vertigo. It lasted about 20 to 30 seconds. It was associated with profound sweating, and she vomited twice. There was no tinnitus. What's the diagnosis? BPK. Okay. And as they say, when somebody has uh, lying down on the bed like that, he gets up and gets a vertigo, very likely that it is an anterior canal BPPV. When they lie down, it's posterior canal. When they get it only on rolling over side to side, it's a horizontal canal BPPV. It's all easy. It's all in one plane. Next slide. So, I do this video in the all the time. And again, one more thing. And this is what happened. As we record, and this is what we have done. We have done the DNC sticks all pipe maneuver. So, the beating up. What happens? The nystagmus beats up, it is the inferior canal. The nystagmus beats down, it is the superior canal. So that's how, if it beats to the left side, it's the right canal. That's how we look at So, the next slide. That's BPP, classically. Lasts for some time, corrects by itself. Next slide. So, but you should remember that positional or positioning vertigo and nystagmus can occur in central causes too. But very classically, it occurs only in peripheral labyrinth. Next slide. This is what it's called. So rarely in central, it's called central paroxysmal position in stagnus. Next slide. There's another scenario, very common scenario nowadays. A 45 year old software engineer that subject to pushing and standing. He, he stands, he feels a sensation of being pushed. That's what I go. Any illusory movement is what I go. Especially when turning. He walks, he turns, he feels like he's being pushed. And feels he might fall but has never fallen down. Next slide. This is his VNG. We run it. Now this is not Dick's help maneuver. This is spontaneous. Just look at his eyes. What is happening? They're not staying in one place. They're like moving all the time. That's a classical sign of an anxiety. They just won't. When we do the VNG, we close their eyes. So it's closed, and they have to keep opening their eyes and look at some blank spot. They won't see anything. And if they don't focus, we switch on a light. So they have to just switch, see that place and keep looking there. So this sort of movement that occurs in the spontaneous, next slide, is typical of an anxiety or stress-induced dizziness. Anxiety neurosis is one of the commonest causes of such pushing. I don't know how many of you have felt it. I have felt it. When I had fever uh, once many years ago for a week, and uh, your routine is all upset, you think like, well, no, everybody goes through the place, why me? Why do I have to get this? I can't get back to work. And then three, four days later, as I was walking and turning, then I had this push. I'm sure most of you would have felt it if you were stressed at some point. But that happens. Because if you are thinking about something and walking, you're more likely to be pushed. And that happens with stress induced disease. Next slide. So the diagnostic algorithm for vertigo is like this. I'm going to come to it again. Next slide. You see this one also. This is very. This is uh, one of my favorite areas. 60 years old man comes with sudden onset, objective and subjective. So he feels he is spinning. He sees the surrounding spinning and reels to one side. Sits like that. He reels to one side. Associated with vomiting, hiccups, difficulty in swallowing. Diagnosis. What would we think of Sudden onset. Six-year-old man, sudden onset. Yes, the, the clue would be the hiccup, difficulty in swallowing. And this is a medullary lesion. Now, this is classical of a lateral medullary syndrome. This is what they will come with. The point with lateral medullary syndrome, unlike other strokes, there is no weakness. They will never have weakness. In the sit, they will be swaying to one side. They will vomit a lot. They will look very toxic. That's one syndrome because it is 
almost like a peripheral vestibular lesion. This is where the vestibular nuclei are involved. So it's more like a peripheral vestibular. There are a lot of vomiting and other things. And they are typically the presence of hiccups and difficulty in swallowing. Next slide. Central probably well and well. And if you were to examine, next slide. This is the classical thing. Open the, you ask him to open the eye, you're going to see the eyes are deviated to one side. Neurology, the eye movements are like, uh, see, many a time, diagnosis ends there. You look at the eyes, it will probably make a diagnosis, especially in stroke, especially in any acute setting. So that. So as you open the eyes, eyes are actually to the left side and then they come back. When you open the eyes, the resting position is being pulled to the, we call it ipsy position, it's pulled. And what else can you make of? With the palpebral fissures, one is smaller, that side has a honus too. So this is where the left side has a honus and if you see a honus and the patient is on the right strip, very likely diagnosis is valid by syndrome in an ICU. There's not much to do, and they move all four limbs. So that's why the nystagmus is also characteristic. Next slide. And there are some, some classic things I'm not going to discuss. There. It's actually called round the house eyes. If they look up and look, look down and look up, the eyes won't go directly like that. They will go around like that. It's called round the house sign. Next slide. So there is a whole spectrum of eye findings in Latin modularity syndrome. And eye findings make the diagnosis and you can actually say whether this is upper lateral modulary or lower lateral modulary, pure clinical neurology can definitely do that. Next slide. By clinical neurology you can say whether this is rostral medulla, this is upper medulla, caudal medulla, more lateral or um, if it is, you know, nausea, vomiting, harness occur in everyone, if it are dysphagia, probably rostral medulla. Next slide. So, I'm going to be done. The 50 year old female presents with sudden moments of unsteadiness, loss of hearing on right side, has double vision, especially on looking to right, and has deviated angle of mouth to left. Diagnosis? So, this is easy. Now, she has sudden onset unsteadiness. So, she has a sudden onset cerebellar. When we say unsteadiness, we mean cerebellar, probably with some vestibular. Loss of hearing on one side, has double vision on looking to one side. Sudden onset, okay. And there's deviated angle of mouth to one side, which means there is a patient. Yes. So there is one, there's a double vision generally means either the third or the sixth or the fourth. Usually when you say horizontal, it's third or the sixth. So most likely the sixth, seventh, eighth, and the cerebral. So this is the classical combination of, next slide, the Ica syndrome. So it's called double deaf disease deviated. Double, they see double because of sixth nerve, they deaf because of eight, dizzy because of cerebellum, deviated mouth because of the seventh. And this is my one, this is not even textbook. It's called Pica syndrome. Next slide. So this is how you can remember Pica syndrome. Pica is not a modular syndrome. Pica is what we just discussed. Next slide. We'll go on. I won't talk about it. Next. So this is something that we commonly use. This is called a head impulse test. Now, if you actually ask the patient to look at the examiner's nose and then rapidly move the head, maybe by 25 degrees. The eye should move. It's called the vestibular ocular or the dull side thing. It should move smoothly. They don't move and they have to do a catch up. The eye doesn't move, but then they have to be. They turn the head, I should have been here. But it goes like that and then they come back. Then that is called a catch up circuit. If there is it's a catch up circuit, it means that hit or head impulse test is positive. And that means that this is a peripheral vestibular. So if you have the head impulse test positive, it means very acute. What do you want to know that this is a stroke? I'll tell you how important it is. Next slide. We're going to be finished. It's called the HIMS. Head impulse, nystagmus, test of skew. Forget everything else. If you do head impulse, you know what they showed? They showed that this predicts brainstem involvement, acute vestibular syndrome, even before the MRI could pick it. So the MRI was negative, but they made a diagnosis of post circulation stroke by clinical neurology. It's not so difficult at all. So doing an impulse test, next slide. Next slide, finish, last slide. Next slide, we'll go on, we'll go on, we'll not talk about this. I just want to show you one tablet for This is something, last one, last one, go on. 
plus go on, go on, go on, go on. No, it's not bad. It's not bad. It's not bad. This is us. So I'll, I'll stop with this. So if you have, you can look at whether this is hearing is normal or impaired, first thing in the patient, and ask about how long it lasts, and probably make the diagnosis. If it lasts only a few seconds, hearing is normal, then you're dealing with BPPV, hearing is normal, minutes is TIA, hours is vestibular migraine, days is CVA or vestibular neuromitis, it lasts for many weeks and probably a demyelination. Thank you, everyone. Stop. Any diet precipitate vertigo? It depends on the cause. Sir. Like uh, if you have vestibular migraine, for example, diets can definitely precipitate a migraine cause vertigo. Uh, the common thing that people say, like, is there any bar, soft and I think it's more the bloated feeling and all that rather than pure uh, fear. One, sorry, since uh, 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 this is uh, important. Okay, let me just say this summary. You know. I think this is a take home points. Always ensure, and I will say ensure you, we should ensure what the patient means by DC. Try to differentiate central vertebral uh, peripheral that can be overlaps, obviously. Not every patient needs a FCT, as you can very actually, actually see from all those causes. Central causes are usually insidious, more severe, while peripheral causes are mostly abrupt and benign. That's a problem. They are more abrupt. Vestibular suppressants, the ones that we use all the time, Stugeron, Stematil, I'm, I'm telling the brand names because that's what we use. Please remember they have to be used only in short bursts. Very important. Because what we do, we do when we have BPPV, you treat somebody with a stuger on a stematil, what we are treating, what we are doing is suppressing the normal side. We are not treating the disease side. Because the vertigo is because one side is working. If both sides are gone, you will not have breathing sensation at all. So what we are doing is suppressing the normal side. And we are not allowing adaptation to happen. So very important that is never used beyond say 3-5 days. Continuously use that vestibular system is to, going to be totally damaged. So very important to remember that. Please do remember the cervical spondylosis is not a cause of vertigo. It never is. It can only cause a mild dizziness. Cervical spondylosis is not a cause of real vertigo. Thank Thank you.